Hello, this presentation is about the tragedy of the commons. In this case, commons, we mean common pool resources. Common pool resources are resources from which it is difficult to exclude others and their takings affect what is left for you. So some good examples of common pool resources are fishing in the oceans. It's very difficult to, to exclude other people from fishing in the ocean. And how and what other people fish can affect what, what you're catching and how much you're catching. And fish stocks around the world are rapidly depleting. This is a, this is a problem that humanity will have to face. Similarly for rangeland, you can only graze so many cattle per area. If other people are grazing there, it decreases the fodder available for you. When it is difficult to exclude them, this becomes a common pool resource. Same goes for water. There's only so much water in the river. It's difficult to exclude other people from taking water, especially if they're upstream of you. And how much they take can affect how much water is left for you. So here's, oh, here's my picture is fishing, rangeland. You can see here the effects of overgrazing on the left. And here's the Ogallala Aquifer. This is a large underground lake covering several states, as you can see here. And the colors represent how much water is increasing or decreasing in the aquifer. And the orange, red, and yellow reflect decreasing. This is uh, a body of water from which it's difficult to exclude others. And it is currently being pumped dry, so it will affect how much is left for other people to take. Other types of resources, we can organize these into four, four areas on the grid. So you've noticed that there are two themes for common pool resources. They are difficult to exclude others from, so we see excludability difficult in the top row. And what other people take is subtractable to what you can take, so we have high subtractability. Other types of goods on here are private goods, uh, easy to exclude. So the bottom row on the right, we see private goods, and they are highly subtractable, but you can keep other people out. Toll goods are easy to exclude people with low subtractability. This is charging for someone to pay to use your road. Other people using the road doesn't diminish your use of it too much, and because there's a gate with a usually guard, uh, it's easy to exclude people from from using it without paying. And finally, public goods. They're difficult to exclude other people from, but there's low subtractability. Things like breathable air. My breathing doesn't really affect your breathing so much unless we're trapped in an elevator together. Okay, so here's the difference between excludable and subtractable. Excludable goods, can you keep others away? If it's easy to keep others out, you can either require compensation for use, like toll goods, or you can maintain sole management, like private goods, so you can keep other people out. If it's hard to exclude people, if anyone can use it, like breathing, uh, that's a public good. Or, uh, if it, or it can be very difficult to manage. If you can't keep other people out, it can become a common pool resource problem. Subtractable goods, we ask the question, does the use of others affect how much you can take? If it doesn't, their use doesn't matter to you so much, like public goods or toll goods. If it is subtractable, their use can either be restricted, like a private good, or it can be difficult to manage, like a common pool resource. And feel free to, to rewind the presentation and look at the chart on the previous slide. So this is why we call the tragedy of the commons, because it's the tragedy of common pool resources, because they're difficult to manage. So let's go through an example. So you can imagine you're on a big lake and anybody can fish in this lake. Each fisher can fish as much as he or she wants, but overfishing will cause local fish extinction. So if everybody fishes as much as they want, the lake will be fish dry and there won't be any fish left. The question here is, should a fisher keep fishing or should they self-impose a limit? And you can see a little bit how this is looking like the prisoner's dilemma. Do you cooperate? Or do you defect? So you have two options. You can keep fishing, increase your personal success, feed your family, make money, buy a fancy car. Or you can limit yourself, and you can limit how many fish you take. However, the more you limit yourself, the more fish are left for other fishers who are making money, feeding their families, buying fancy cars. So if you impose a limit, the other fishers will benefit at a cost that you've imposed upon yourself. So the prediction is, 
every fisher should keep fishing. And if every other fisher keeps fishing, there's absolutely no reason for you to limit your take as well. And this is why it's called a tragedy of the commons. Common pool resources are highly prone to being depleted because you can't exclude other people and the resource is subtractable. So no one has an incentive to stop their use of the resource because it's subtractable, it's soon used up. So this is actually it happens in real life quite a bit. And this is currently happening with tuna and other large fish populations. You can see the graph on the right. This is the change in individual body size uh, from 2000. So this is just um, 10 years. And you can see the percentage in body size, those um, horizontal bars, everything is below the dashed line of zero. So all of the fish populations since the year 2000 have decreased by about 10% in size. And we can actually apply a really cool life history argument and explain why this is. So we have overfishing by large companies. Larger fish are worth more, so they particularly target fish with larger, larger body sizes. This leads to increased mortality rates of adults, especially large adults. They're more likely to die because they're targeted by fishers. Now we know that increased mortality rates means that you want to decrease your lifespan and decrease your juvenile period. You can look again at the life history lecture to remember that. What this leads to is smaller adult body size. They're spending, they have shorter lives and they're, they have shorter Juvenile periods, so shorter periods for growth, which means that they have smaller adult bodies. And since we began measuring fish body size, the estimate is that large fish like tuna are actually one-fifth of the size that they used to be. And so this is an example of tragedy of the commons because it's a common pool resource. You can't keep other people out. And as we've seen here, it's highly subtractable. There are many fewer fish in the sea, and those that are are significantly smaller than they used to be. So the tragedy here is that eventually there are no more fish in the lake. And we can see how this is a prisoner dilemma type payoff. Why cooperate when it's in everyone else's best interest to defect? It's, it may be a good idea for everybody to cooperate, but it's very hard to get to the solution. It takes a lot of trust that other people are going to cooperate also. And when you look at the way the game is set up for them, you can see how the pull is always for them to defect. So the question then becomes, well, this is a tragedy, we'd like to do something about it. How would you get the fishers to limit their takes? And this has been very well studied. There's a really interesting case up in Maine where a lot of lobster are fished. And lobster populations crashed at the beginning of the 20th century. And interestingly, the lobster fishermen have solved the tragedy of the commons up here. And this is a picture of Jim Atchison He's the anthropologist who studies these lobster gangs, and you can see their territories on this map on the right in the Gulf of Maine. And he says, up until 1990, it was thought that there were generally two solutions to resource management problems, management problems for common pool resources. One is to privatize everything. If you don't have to worry about other people taking, you can self-limit and benefit from that limit. The other is to have the government come down, come in with top-down rules and have the government impose limits on everybody and punish them when they don't follow them so it changes the game so that it makes more sense to follow the rules. There's a third option, and this is what's actually working in the Gulf of Maine. It's called local governance. So essentially what these guys are doing is they're changing the game. They're changing it from a prisoner's dilemma to something much more like a stag hunt that we discussed. So here's how they're doing it. They've got these um, territories that you saw on the map on the previous slide. There's their, their territories. Oh, they changed the game. They're working as gangs uh, from harbors within these territories to defend their traps and to defend their territory. So they have privatized the area to some extent, but they've privatized it among small groups of fishermen. And they keep very close track of what everyone in their group is doing. Everyone comes back to the harbor at the end of the day. They see what other people are catching. And there's a lot of social networking and reputation. And what they're limiting mostly here is size. And you see this guy t tossing out a lobster that's too small. The bigger the lobsters are, the, the better breeders they are. So they are supposed to put back breeding females and lobsters under a certain size. So they keep track of what other people are catching and they can enforce their local rules about catch size. In some areas, 
uh, size limits are even stricter than the formal laws imposed by the U.S. government. So these are also in place as kind of a bare minimum, but these locally enforced gang rules often take it a step further. And by keeping track of everybody, they've essentially imposed some accountability and changed the game, making it make more sense to participate and cooperate than not. And this is what has been the result. You can see the total value of, uh, or the total catch here on the right in millions of pounds starting in uh, 1950. That's the light blue line. And you can see the total catch has gone from about 20 million pounds up to about between 60 and 70 million pounds. So they've tripled, almost quadrupled the pounds of lobster they've been able to catch by restricting size limits and by working together to ensure that everyone restricts their size limits. So this is really cheering that we can solve the tragedy of the commons through a, a variety of mechanisms that changes the game. Some other examples of solving the tragedy of the commons is deforestation in the Dominican Republic. There's been a large governmental push to change the way that logging is done and to increase the sustainability of logging. D the Dominican Republic and Haiti share an island. You can see Haiti here has not imposed restrictions on logging, and it's very clear the difference between forestation on the left and forestation on the right. An interesting common pool resource here in the United States that we faced back in the 1930s was erosion, and the fact that so many farmers went out to areas like Oklahoma where there's little and infrequent rainfall and clear-cut the prairie, and the prairie holds all the topsoil down. So by doing this, they released all this dust, and these huge dust clouds are rolling clear through New York. Eventually, the government sent out some agrarian scientists, and they found new ways of plowing that does not disturb the topsoil as much and maintains water in the ground as well, and they also decrease the amount of land that was plowed. And now farmers in the area, many of them um, have parents who are still alive during the Dust Bowl, uh, cooperate because they and, and plow in a sustainable way because they've seen the effects of not cooperating and so they've actually t played the game out to the resource being depleted and now they've seen the cost and so there's a higher incentive to cooperate. So we're hopeful that human cooperation can solve some of these common pool resource problems and maintain a humane quality of life for people while also sustainably managing resources. I've got some great readings if you're interested on these topics. I'm happy to, su to suggest some. You can also check out Ken Burns' documentary on the Dust Bowl, which is a really interesting coverage of this topic. So thanks for listening. See you next time.